So I just want to start by giving you a little overview of what to expect from this evening. I'm going to be speaking um, in just a short while. We'll also be hearing from Fiona Toomey from HUG and from Norma of Embrace Farm. Before that, we're going to just run through a few little bits of housekeeping. We can't see you, but you can see us. The webinars you may have heard is being recorded, but you're not being recorded. It's only myself and the panelists who will be visible. You will not be visible. You'll be able to watch back though. So if you miss something this evening, know that it will be available. We'll let you know where afterwards. And you can also share a link to the recording as well. If you think that there's somebody who might benefit from watching who, were, who wasn't able to be here this evening. The Q&A is open, but it's more of an invitation to put in your reflections rather than questions. We're not in a position to answer questions about your unique and individual situation, but you can email HUG or Embrace Farm after the webinar, and we'll give you all of their contact details at the end of the webinar this evening. Anything that you write in the Q&A uh, will be seen by all of the panelists, but it won't be seen by other participants. And if you'd like your name to be anonymous, just make sure you click that little box. We would love to read out some of your comments or reflections at the end of the evening. So if anything grabs your attention as the evening progresses, please do share it there in the Q&A. Um, if you'd like to get some support on something specific, please do take note of their contact details at the end of the webinar. Um, share your comments and your feedback, share what resonates with you as we go along um, or at the end of the evening when we invite you to do that. And like I said, Arlene and Alma will read out some of your reflections and comments at the end. So I'd love to introduce you first to the team tonight before I launch into my presentation. And um, if everybody would turn on their cameras, that would be great. And we'll start there with Amanda. Can't hear you, Amanda. There's going to be a bit of that this evening, I think. We might go to Fiona while Amanda's getting sorted there. Hello everyone, uh, Fiona Toomey from HUG here. Firstly, really lovely that so many of you could join us and thank you all so much for your time. And I hope that you will find this evening supportive and beneficial. Thanks Fiona, we'll jump to you Amanda again there. Uh, second time lucky. Um, my name is Amanda and I work with the Irish Hospice Foundation and I work in a bereavement development role and I just feel privileged to be invited to attend this evening. So thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Norma, we'll jump over to yourself. Hi, hi, Norma from Embrace Farm. And I guess um, uh, tonight's webinar is really the first of its kind for the farming community. So delighted to be able to bring this to the farming community with the support of, of HUG and the IHF and Liz. So happy to be here. Thanks, Norma. Alma, can we go to you next? Certainly, my name is Alma Jordan. Um, I work with Embrace Farm. And again, just to reiterate what has been said, really, really delighted and honoured um, to be taking part in this event tonight and um, and to say a big thank you to everyone who has joined this, this evening. And uh, if you do need any support, uh, we will be sharing de details throughout the event and also at the end. Thanks very much, Alma and Arlene. Hello, yes, my name is Arlene and I work with HUG and yeah, I resonate with everyone what they've said. It's it's an honour to be here this evening and to support those in the farming community. So um, great to connect with everyone tonight. Great, thank you so much, everybody. And I've asked some of the team to keep their cameras on this evening so that I'm actually speaking to somebody rather than just speaking into the little green dot on my computer here. So that's why their, their cameras will be on. Before I move into my presentation, um, I have a candle here and I'd like to invite everybody here with us. If you'd like to, you might like to also light a candle. And I'm going to be keeping this candle lit for the duration of the webinar this evening. Um, 
it's just to symbolically remember our loved ones who have died. And like I said, if you'd like to light a candle, please feel free to do that. Or I am happy to hold them in my candle here also. So I'm going to start with just saying a few words about the organizations that you're going to hear from. First up is Shapes of Grief. Um, my name is Liz Gleason, and I am the curator of Shapes of Grief. It was started in 2019, started off as a podcast, and I recognized just the need to share stories about loss and grief to help normalize the experience for people. It was an idea that was born at my kitchen table, but it soon became a podcast that was known throughout the country with hundreds of thousands of listeners in its first year because there's hundreds of thousands of bereaved people in our country every year. I developed an online training program to offer affordable and compassionate professional grief training to anyone interested in learning more about grief and loss. And that's available at shapesofgrief.com. And I still run the podcast and the online training and offer talks like this evening's webinar to a variety of different organizations. Like many people, I'm no stranger to loss and grief in my own personal life also. Um, Embrace Farm is a farming organization which was founded by Brian and Norma Rohan, a farming family from Shanahoe in County Leash uh, in 2014. So Brian and his wife Norma, with their extended family, lost Brian's father, Liam, Liam Rohan, to a sudden farm accident in 2013. Their aim was to set up a support network for farm families who, like them, have lost a loved one or suffered serious injury in a farming accident. Next up, we'll have HUG. HUG is a national suicide bereavement charity. Their mission is to provide hope and healing to any adult who's been bereaved by suicide in the Republic of Ireland. They offer peer support groups led by trained volunteers uh, who have also been bereaved by suicide. HUG offers telephone support and general information about what it means to be bereaved by suicide. HUG has 16 support groups in Ireland, which operate in person and also online. They help people to connect socially, which is really important, meeting others who've experienced the death of a loved one by suicide. They offer training and education for adults to help them understand what they're going through and to feel hopefully a little less isolated and lonely in their grief. So without further, uh, without further ado, I'm going to offer you my presentation. It's going to take approximately 30 minutes. We're going to look at loss and grief, how it can impact us, what's different about suicide bereavement, and a little bit about what we can expect from the grieving process. You'll probably recognize a lot of your own experiences in what I say. Um, and like I said earlier, please do share your reflections in the Q&A, not so much your questions, but your reflections, or maybe if you're learning something or if something resonates with you or surprises you, we'd, we would love you to be involved in this evening's webinar. So bear with me just for a minute and hopefully the screen sharing will be Oh yeah, there we go. Doesn't always go smoothly. Okay. So every year in Ireland, around 500 people die by suicide, which means that approximately 60,000 people are impacted. So statistics tell us that about 135 people are impacted by every death by suicide. Among them will be our parents, our spouses, our children, our friends, our siblings, our neighbors, our colleagues and us. Most of us need understanding, acknowledgement of our loss, kindness, information about grief, and somebody to normalize our feelings and keep us company. We know the research tells us that Everybody who is bereaved, whether it's by suicide or not, everybody needs their loss acknowledged, 
everybody needs support from family, friends and community. It doesn't mean that everybody's good at accepting that, but everybody does need a bit of support and everybody needs information about grief. And we know that for about 60% of bereaved people, that will be enough. So most people don't need additional support, such as counselling or, or group therapy or group counselling. However, some people, and particularly if you've been bereaved by suicide, do need additional support. So that may just be you. We know that the people, that 30% that need extra support, are those who've been bereaved by a sudden, unpredictable death. Maybe the death of a child or an out of time death. Deaths by suicide or homicide or violence or through accident can also require some additional support. Or if you've had a mental health difficulty before a loss, a loss can really exacerbate that and may lead to the need for additional support. Or not all of us have reliable support from our families. Not all of us have great community support. Sometimes our families are dysfunctional and even though they're around us, we may not lean on them when we need support. So people like that may need that additional support. And research tells us that those who feel they need support tend to benefit from support. So when somebody we love dies, it's one person that has died, yet it can feel like everything has changed. We can see the whole world with totally different eyes. One person has gone, yet somehow everything feels like it has changed. Grief can change us and impact us in so many different ways, psychologically, we can find ourselves with intrusive thoughts, lying awake at night, unable to get rid of that rumination, those thoughts going over and over, trying to figure out what's happened. Grief can impact us emotionally. It's not just sadness at all. Grief can often leave us feeling terrified or anxious or full of fear. And that's an emotion that a lot of people don't know is a really normal part of bereavement after a significant loss. Grief can impact us physically, um, as well as those feelings of anxiety. It can impact our appetite. It can impact our immune system. We can get more sick than usual. We can get physical pain. I know in my practice, when I support people, they'll often say, I have a pain just here in my, my chest. It feels heavy, or it feels like someone's got their foot on my chest. That's very common. Behaviorally, behaviorally, we can change also. We can find ourselves doing what's called ugly coping, drinking too much, smoking too much, maybe shutting ourselves off from people we love, isolating ourselves. We know that social connection can be really helpful to us following a bereavement, yet often it's the last thing we want to do. For many of us, we, we withdraw and isolate and it can be helpful to try and push through that and try and connect with people if we can we can become hyper vigilant so this is where we're looking for danger we're feeling danger all around us we're not trusting people everybody feels like a bit of a threat this is very common because grief is such a profound stressor it can really shoot us into that fight or flight response that our bodies have under threat. We can often hear or see or feel threat where none exists, yet to us, we feel threatened. So it's good to bear that in mind as well. Grief is not just that primary loss of who has died, but there's many secondary losses also. Maybe we've lost the person who was our primary support in life, our confidant, our go-to person. Maybe our home and our finances have been significantly impacted by the death of this person. Maybe we had assumptions about our future and what retirement might look like, and these assumptions have been shattered. 
maybe there's more family conflicts or there's a family conflict as a result of the loss. If you think about it, if my body is in fight or flight and so is everybody around us, we're much more likely to engage in family conflicts and fall out with each other or feel threatened by each other um, following a loss or a bereavement. We might be worried about surviving family members. We might be worried about the spouse of the person who's died um, or, or other people who are close to them. We can feel a loss of our place in the community. We might feel a loss of faith or we might strengthen our faith. But all of these secondary losses are really important to bear in mind. When somebody dies, there's a ripple effect into almost every area of our life. Did you know that there's no stages of grief? The stages of grief are a myth and they don't actually exist. Now, some people certainly do feel acceptance or denial or bargaining or anger, but they're not in some neat uh, linear fashion. Grief doesn't have a beginning, a middle and an end. It's, it's much more chaotic than that. And everybody grieves differently and everybody grieves every loss differently also. So you might feel depression or acceptance or anger or denial, but you could feel it all in one day and in no particular order. So do bear that in mind. There isn't a prescriptive way to grieve. Why we grieve and how we grieve depends on a myriad of different reasons and everybody will grieve uniquely and differently. Really important to know that in your family, that how you're grieving could look very, very different to how somebody else is grieving, but it doesn't mean that they're not grieving and it doesn't mean that you're not grieving. When we are grieving, we don't fall into a sadness and stay there till we're better. We move in and out of these different emotions. And it's like, it's like this oscillation, if you like, moving into grief, having a break, moving into grief, having a break. And sometimes when we're in that break, that restoration orientation, we can feel guilty. We can feel like there's something wrong with me. I don't feel super sad right now or I feel numb. But before you know it, you'll be back in that loss orientation, feeling that intrusion of grief, maybe even feeling overwhelmed with your grief, maybe crying a lot or feeling anxious. So they say that a normal, good, healthy grieving process is moving in and out of these two areas where we face our grief, we let the crying come, we feel the pain of it, and then we also have a break. We call this dosing. Like when we're taking medicine, we don't drink the bottle all at once. We take a bit, we give it a break. We take a bit, we give it a break. Grieving is similar. Taking a break from your grief is just as important as facing your grief. So do, do try and ensure that you're giving both sides time and attention every day, ideally. This is another little theory that we're going to look at. And this was developed by a bereaved parent. And if you just look at the jars there along the top, she used to say, or we used to say that grief over time, it shrinks, it gets smaller. So if we're the jar and that ball is our grief, at the beginning, we are full of it. All we see is a world through the lens of loss, through the lens of grief. It really feels like, or can feel like, it's penetrated every cell of our body. And they used to think that over time it would get less and it would diminish. But we have this theory that actually the grief doesn't really dissolve like that, doesn't go away like a cold or a flu or a virus. Our experience of loss really stays with us. That feeling of grief really stays with us for a long time. But what happens is we have to grow. We have to change. We have to adapt and accommodate our loss. So we go through profound psychological changes to make ourselves resilient enough or flexible enough to be able to carry our loss. And as we grow and adapt and change, the grief becomes easier to carry. 
we also need to talk about our loss. Not everybody now, but particularly those of us who are quite emotional, um, intuitive grievers, we call them. Some of us like to cry, like to talk to our friends. We like to go over the story again and again. And it's our way of trying to make sense of what happened. We need to hear it again and again and again to make sense of it, to find the words to speak it, to find a way to narrate our story. And um, particularly if we're intuitive grievers. Now, some of us are instrumental grievers. We don't cry that much. We don't like to be emotional. We don't really like to talk about it. We're more the type who will fix the fence if it's broken or build a garden or get out and do something. And we're problem solvers. And for intuitive grievers, it can be quite hard to understand instrumental grievers. And for instrumental grievers, it can be quite hard to understand intuitive grievers. So just remember, we all grieve differently and we've all got different grieving styles. And some of us will move in between intuitive and instrumental as we go through our grief, sometimes wanting to cry or needing to cry, sometimes wanting to talk about it, and other times just wanting to get on with things. There's no right way. So what happens when someone we love dies by suicide? The impact of suicide bereavement is can be really tremendous. I remember someone describing it to me once like, it's like if grief is the radio on, suicide bereavement is when someone turns the volume right up to maximum. We feel it so much more acutely. Usually it's sudden or unexpected. Even if we've wondered about it or thought it might happen, it can still really shock us and it can be violent or traumatic. There's probably a lot more shock and a lot more trauma in our bodies as a result of the circumstances of a death by suicide. The emotional responses, and I would say the intense emotional responses that we may feel may be very unfamiliar. They can be frightening and they can feel unbearable and unmanageable at times. We might have experienced a loss before, but this feels like a whole other experience. It can be much harder to make sense of the loss and find a way to tell the story of what, is, what has happened or to find the words to explain what has happened. Often we can feel it physically. Our body knows what's happened, but we can't put words on the experience. People bereaved by suicide might find themselves considering suicide for themselves. That can be very common. Post-traumatic stress disorder is much more common after a suicide bereavement than of any other types of loss. It may cause flashbacks and intrusive thoughts. So if you're feeling any of this, please know that this really can be expected when someone we love dies by suicide. It's not because you're doing grief wrong or there's something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. This can really be expected and there is support for you if you're feeling anything that I've just said, named here. I hope you can make sense of this. There are no stages of grief, but we do say that the period after a loss is called acute grief. That's when our experience of grief is really strong. It's like the volume is high up. Everything we do and say is with, is with this experience of grief in every cell of our body. It's like the jar that's full of grief. In the acute phase of grief, we are experiencing loss in everything we do with little moments of reprieve, maybe. Now, what happens after acute grief is we begin to integrate our grief. This doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens when we're doing the work of grief, which is crying, talking about our loss, trying to make meaning of our loss, allowing support in, trying to make sense of our loss, um, maybe going to a peer support group, maybe going to a counsellor, maybe sitting in the bedroom of the person 
we love who has died. All of these things as we confront our grief and take a break from it is integrating our loss. It's helping it to become real in our physical bodies, our emotional bodies and our mental bodies. So over time, I hate to put a number on it, it could be six months, it could be 12, it could be 18 months, but over time, we gradually begin to integrate our grief. If our grief is staying really high over a prolonged period of time, 12 months, 18 months, two years, it doesn't feel like it's getting any better, it doesn't feel like it's integrating, we probably would benefit from professional intervention. So keep an eye out for that. It's not just time that helps us to integrate our grief, it's what we do with the time. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But this integration period can take longer following a suicide bereavement. There's a profound physical, psychological, emotional and spiritual process that we must go through. And we don't want to go through it. We don't want to be bereaved by suicide, but we're being forced to go through this process. And for each of us, it has a different timeline. Following a suicide bereavement, we can feel shame, stigma, marginalization. All of these things can exacerbate our grief and make it harder to process and harder to integrate and it can take longer. But if you were to go to a peer group, for example, where you're meeting other people who are experiencing similar impacts of their bereavement, that can really help to take away the shame and the stigma and, the mar and that sense of marginalization. We can be worried about what people are saying. Are they talking about, that, about us? Are they judging us? What do the neighbors think? What, do, what are they thinking about? Um, are they blaming me? All of these are really common ruminations that can go through our heads. Most of the time, people are feeling just compassion and empathy and want to support and help, but it can really feel like there's a big chasm between the people in our community and what I am experiencing as someone who's been bereaved by suicide. That can feel like a huge chasm that can take a long time to bridge. People really can say the wrong things and can really make us feel worse. I'm sure you can give us lots of examples. And if you'd like to, please do feel free to use the Q&A. They mostly don't mean it. It's people putting two left feet into it. Maybe they haven't had this experience, so they don't know what it's like to be at the receiving end. People are just clumsy, but it can be incredibly painful. But if we can be the bigger person and forgive them and, and try and let the compassion rule rather than the clumsiness, it can save us harboring a lot of anger and resentment, which again exacerbates the grieving process. It's so common to ask these questions when we've been bereaved by suicide. Why did this happen? Is there anything I could have done or should have done to have prevented this? If only I had, and cue 3000 things that we could put in there. Sometimes there are no answers to these questions. And sometimes we've to stretch and grow and adapt and be flexible to allow unanswered questions exist in us. So unique to the farming community, farmers make up 6% of Ireland's workforce, yet half of all workplace fatalities happen on farms. Almost a quarter of all Irish farmers have suicidal ideation. That means they think about it as, an op as, a, as a possible option to get away from their problems or to get away from their overwhelming feelings. Suicide in the Irish farming community is a significant area of concern. So why are farmers more at risk than the general population? Well, farm life is often really socially isolating. The work can be relentless 
and it's often difficult to get any real break or respite. Many farmers work alone and bear the burden of responsibility for the farm alone. Sometimes crop or herd outcomes are out of their control and there can be a loss of agency. The costs of running a farm are huge and there can be financial uncertainty. There can be expensive equipment or machinery that's needed. Um, it's more common to have family conflicts in the farming community and outdated traditions and farming culture may lead to a lack of support. Sorry. The breaking of traditions, maybe the adult children don't want farming as a lifestyle, move away or choose a different lifestyle. But life stressors among Irish farmers are such that, my apologies, Life stressors amongst Irish farmers are such that suicide within the farming community is significantly higher than among the general population. The Irish Farmers Association recognizes this and has brought out this guide dealing with stress. This is, there's a sy systematic problem here. It's recognized by the Irish Farmers Association. It's in the statistics. This is not your fault. The death of someone you love in the Irish farming community is not your fault. And it's really important to know that. We often wonder, is it my fault? Is there something I could have done? But we know that suicide in the Irish farming community is a significant problem throughout the country. It's really common to feel that hole in the soul when someone you love dies by suicide. Um, this quote doesn't go with this statue, but this is a, a Swiss artist who, developed, who, who built this bronze statue called Melancholy. And a lot of people who've been bereaved, particularly by suicide, describe this internal emptiness that they feel. People bereaved by suicide within the farming community are often not afforded the same time and space to grieve. Sometimes the responsibility of the farm falls immediately on their shoulders, which compounds the impact of grief and trauma. For some people, they have to get back to work immediately and take up the role of the person who has died. Um, I'm going to invite, I think it's Arlene is going to read this one, yeah. just to um, take us through this little case study from Lisa Tate in Cavan. Thanks, Arlene. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, Lisa said, unfortunately, in April 2019, my father and best friend passed away from suicide and the responsibility fell on my shoulders overnight. To say it was daunting was an understatement. I had always had backup from him when I needed to do any job. He was always at the end of the phone if I had any questions. Having time was always a team effort and I suddenly found myself alone. The fear of failing and being judged on changes people believing I would not be able to continue with the land without him, and the rumors that the land would be put up for sale all consumed my mind. I'm not sure whether it was the love for my livestock or the ignorance with all the doubts people around me had, but I dug my heels in and continued with my Uncle Pork's help and support. He is always around to lend a hand and give a few words of encouragement to keep the thing going. I will always be so grateful for his presence then and now. Thanks so much, Arlene. And I'm sure Lisa's words there will resonate with many of you here this evening. Um, it's great to see the numbers so high this evening. Um, if any of that resonates with you, if you've had similar experiences or, or maybe something different, let us know in the Q&A. We really want to hear from you. We want to hear how this is all landing. And before we move on to the next case study, which Alma is going to read out, I just want to invite you all just to take a minute to take a breath. Sometimes when we're listening to difficult topics and difficult themes, we can hold our breath. We can forget to breathe. So the invitation is just to shake out your bodies a little. We can't see you, so you can look as ridiculous as you want. Shake out your bodies and just take a little breath and make sure that you're comfortable and your body's at ease while you're listening to this presentation. Um, 
I mean, to move on now to Megan's experience of being bereaved by suicide. And Alma, would you please read that? Certainly. On Thursday, October 18th, 2012, my father, Trevor Morrow, lost his battle with his mental health. He was found at our family home after failing to turn up to work that morning. My whole world started to crumble and I felt there was no way I could ever deal. How was a 13 year old going to live without her father? My younger brother was only 10 and my, my younger sister was only three. How could he leave the three of us and our poor mother alone? This was a man who told us jokes before we went to school the morning he passed. My father's many struggles were never exposed to us children and we later only found out during his wake he was in serious financial difficulty with a drinking problem on top. Dairy farming has always been a passion but it also became my escape following my father's suicide. Life gets easier. You learn to deal with your grief with whatever way suits best. The thought that we are at peace now also helps me, that we that they are at peace now also helps me when I begin to think of my father. Thank you so much, Alma. So just a little nod to those of you at home. I'm sure there's familiar things that are familiar in those two stories. Um, I'm sure there's emotions. I'm sure you feel this. It is moving. It's sad. And Please just let your tears drop if they're there. Give yourself lots of breath. And my invitation to you is just to give yourself permission to feel whatever it is you're feeling right now. A lot of us run away from grief and it can cause a lot of suffering and fear. And if we can actually just sit with it and let it come and let it be, uh, it can give us great respite and a great break in the days afterwards. So if that resonates with you, maybe give yourself a break and just allow it, allow it to be whatever that looks like for you. So why do we grieve? Why, what, what purpose does grieving serve? If we love, we're going to grieve. It just comes with the territory. We love people to attach to them. And when that's ruptured, we're going to grieve and long for them and yearn for them and miss them. It's going to take time to accept that this has really happened. Now we can know that this has happened immediately, but really knowing in every cell of our body and accepting that it's true can really take time, six, 12, 18 months maybe. The brain, our brains don't learn from knowledge, and information, our brains learn from experience. So we've got to experience the world without the person we love before we can fully accept that this is true, this is real, this has happened. So I hope you can see the difference there between knowing someone has died and actually accepting fully that it's real. They're two different things. When we have those moments of accepting, damn, this is real, this is happening, you know, we can wake up in the morning and have a, a split second of reprieve and then it comes crashing in as we remember the pain of the loss follows. And like I alluded to there, we really need to allow ourselves to feel that pain. The only way to get through grief is by grieving. It's a normal adaptive necessary response to loss so those tears um are so essential and uh, feeling the pain of grief is so essential if we are to move forward and integrate our loss we can discern where and with who we do that but it's so important to give ourselves time to to grieve we then need to learn how to live with the loss how do i live now that they aren't here and as you can see from those two women that Arlene and Alma shared their stories, they learned to adapt. They overcame impossible grief. They learned to find ways to live with their loss. They learned ways of doing that. And you will too. And if you need help to find those ways, there is help and support. We then hopefully, eventually, when we've done the work of grief, 
we'll learn to re-engage with life again and allow ourselves to have hope for our future. We have to get out of our own way sometimes and give ourselves permission to be able to have a future that has love in it again and hope again and some joyful moments and moments of contentedness. Grieving is often a process of adjusting to a new reality. It's a new reality that we haven't chosen. The sooner we turn towards this new reality and allow the grief to come, the more ease we will likely experience. We don't move on or forget people that have died or get over them. We learn to accommodate our loss and we move forward with them. We develop new ways to relate to those who have died and we call this continuing bonds. So it's really important to know there's no moving on, there's no getting over, you don't, this isn't something you leave behind and get on with your life. You need to bring them with you for most of us. Bring them with you, with you. find ways to continue that bond, whatever that might look like. It could be planting a tree, it could be listening to music, it could be, you know, an area of the garden, whatever is personal to you. I know for me, I've got bird feeders right outside my window that I bought the day my dad died. And every time I look at the bird feeders, they remind me of him. And I feel that flutter of love rather than grief now. That's one of the ways I continue a bond with my father. I'd love to know if you're out there listening and um, how do you continue a bond with your loved ones please let us know, put it in the Q&A. So I'm going to wrap up now. Key takeaways, grief is a normal adaptive response to loss. Please, please give yourselves permission to grieve, whatever that looks like for you. Suicide bereavement can often have a much greater impact than other losses. It can be very physical. That feeling of threat and fear can be, you know, like I said, the volume right up on that. It's really important that we allow people in just to be alongside us, not to advise us, not to try and fix us, not to take us out of it, but just to be alongside us to regulate our bodies. When someone close to us, when someone close to us dies by suicide, our life often changes dramatically. We don't bounce back or get over this loss but we slowly get used to it. We adapt to the changes in our lives and we learn to live with them. We are allowed to grow around our grief and find moments of joy again. Please find ways to allow yourself to be okay. We often hear that expression, it's okay to not be okay. And of course that's so true and important. And I want to say also, it's okay to be okay. And ideally we will move between both of these places. We're allowed to have hopes and dreams for the future again, despite losing someone we love to suicide. Living a good life and learning how to thrive again is possible if we don't let anyone get in the way, including ourselves. From my experience, we're our own worst enemy. So see how you're getting in your way and how can you get out of your way and allow yourself to move forward. When we're grieving, we really need a profound kindness towards ourselves. Kindness for our grief, our sorrow, kindness for our crazy thoughts, kindness when we're feeling awake at night, our insomnia, our anger, kindness towards our own vulnerability and the vulnerability of others, kindness for our lives that have often become unrecognizable after suicide loss. The rebuilding of our lives will be slow, but it will happen. Be excessively gentle with yourself. They're the words of John O'Donoghue, the poet. Be excessively gentle with yourself as you move forward. Bring them with you, your loved one who's died and allow space for new good things and good people too. Where possible, and as often as possible, and I couldn't resist putting this in, allow hugs and embraces. We're hosted tonight by Hug and Embrace Farm. 
And this might, see, this might seem kind of cheesy, but honestly, when we've had a profound loss, our body, it's like someone has taken a sledgehammer to our nervous system. The, the absence of them is everywhere and our bodies are so dysregulated. One of the best ways to regulate ourselves again after profound loss is physical touch, the physical presence of other people. It can be just a hand on our back, someone sitting alongside us, but where possible, allow yourself to be touched both, both emotionally and physically. Um, even if it's by pets or by nature, um, allow contact with each other or with the earth if that's easier for you. So I'm wrapping up my presentation now, but we are going to be hearing from other speakers. Um, like I said, my podcast and training program is at shapesofgrief.com. I'm going to invite you to use the chat now to put some reflections into the chat if you, in, if you wish, um, anything that resonated with you or that impacted you. Uh, just a reminder, the candle is still lighting here. And we're going to take just a really short two or three minute break now to enable you to run to the bathroom if you need to, make a cup of tea, get a glass of water, maybe grab a breath of fresh air outside your front door. And we're going to be coming back literally in two or three minutes. Um, before we do that, I'm going to share a little video for those of you who want to wait on screen. Um, let me just make sure I share the sound. Bear with me, there's always a little bit of faffing around, isn't there? Okay, I have to get rid of my presentation first. So literally just two minutes. Um, I have to find you again. Here we go. Okay, we're here. Sorry about that, folks. Enjoy this music. It's called The Lost Words. And we'll see you in two or three minutes. With care, my love, and speak the things you see. Let your names take and root and thrive and grow. And even as you travel far from heather, crag, and river, may you, like the little fisher, set the stream alight with glitter. May you enter now as otter, without falter, into water. Look to the sky with care, my love, and speak the things you see. Let your names take a root and thrive and grow. And even as you journey on, Past dying stars exploding Like the gilded one in flight Leave your little gifts of light And in the dead of night, my darling Find the gleaming eye of starling Like the little aviator Sing your heart to all dark matter
through the world with care, my love, and sing the things that you see. Swim you deeper, oh my little silver seeker. Even as the hour grows bleaker, be the singer and the speaker. And in city and in forest, let the larks become your chorus. And when every hope is gone, let the raven call you. And here we are back again now. I hope you all managed to get a quick cup of tea or a glass of water. Um, and I hope you're finding this evening helpful so far. We're going to be hearing from two more speakers. Um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce Norma, Norma Rowan. Um, Norma will be sharing the story behind the foundation of Embrace Farm sharing more about the lived experience of the farm families who Embrace Farm supports. Norma will discuss how death by suicide is affecting farm families in Ireland and the impact on both those left behind and the community around them. So um, join me in welcoming Norma. Hey, thank you, Liz. Uh, I really like that music. It's, it's really lovely. Um, I want to thank you as well, Liz, for making us all feel very comfortable here tonight uh, to be able to take that space. Um, lots of information to take in, so a really nice presentation. Um, I guess the other thing I'd like to say is I'm delighted to be collaborating with HOG as well tonight to host this um, webinar for the farming community. I guess the best way to describe Embrace Farm and HUG is Embrace Farm knows about farming and the impact of a sudden death to the farming community and HUG know about the impact of suicide on our families. So by coming together, um, we're bringing our skills together. We just want farm families to know that there is support out there for you should you wish to avail of it. So a little bit about Embrace Farm first. Um, Embrace Farm was founded 10 years ago, following the tragic death of my father-in-law on our farm. Um, after a while, my husband and I, we started to look for some outside support, which is specific to farming. Um, there wasn't any to be found. So after many conversations, we decided to set up our own charity, Embrace Farm. Initially a support network to, uh, to those affected by farm accidents supporting both the bereaved family and the survivor of a farm accident. Over the past 18 months, we have been able to expand our services to farm families bereaved, <coughs> excuse me, bereaved in all types of sudden death. So we're really heartened to be able to bring you tonight's webinar in collaboration with HUG to let you know about the support that we can provide to you should you wish to avail of it. Now, Liz did mention some statistics uh, and information on her um, presentation around um, statistics. Um, government and state agencies are currently working on researching what the impact of death by suicide is on the farm community. The CSO, um, the Central Statistics Office and Chagask are trying to quantify how many farmers die by suicide in this country. So right now, it is difficult for me to say with absolute certainty what, the, what those figures are. Those of you attending tonight are here because someone close to you has died by suicide. All of us in the farming community will know somebody who has died by suicide. It has taken a while for the agri-sector to catch up with that on an official basis. 
and they do need to know what the figures are because it's difficult to address something if you don't know what the scale of it is. And I guess sitting here today, I, I am saying, I am seeing the, the government, the state agencies and those people working on that data, trying to figure out exactly what it is. Um, there's another bit of work to be done on that, um, but it is being done and that's good to see. It wasn't being done a few years ago. So, however, in saying all of that, Embrace Farm, we'll talk about the people behind those statistics. We put a person to each one of those numbers and we speak about the true toll of devastation caused to the family behind. These farmers that die suddenly are more than just a number to all of us here tonight. They each leave a legacy behind them and none more so than to you, their family. So tonight I'd like to tell you about some of the people that we meet in Embrace Farm and what affects them and their family following a sudden death within the farm family. I guess we mainly meet women in all stages of their lives, widowed and left behind to pick up the pieces both emotionally and practically. They face legal and financial difficulties, possibly with no will in place maybe no access to the farm business bank account. They're, they face succession issues. What does a young widow do with the farm? Older widows may have a, an adult child to take over, but a younger widow with young children faces the dilemma of what to do. Does she farm it? Does she lease it out? Does she sell it? Or does she hold on to it for her children? Will they even want to farm it in 10 or 15 years time? So many questions. They face a lot of issues around <clears throat> farm enterprise regulations and schemes. Some widows are very familiar with the workings of daily farm life, but others are not. How do they begin to navigate the myriad of paperwork, meeting deadlines for schemes, the regulations that need to be adhered to, and the endless decisions that need to be made? One lady told us of how she used to watch to see what the neighbour was doing. OK, right. He's at slurry today. Yeah, that's something I need to do. Another lady told us of being fined by the Department of Agriculture, receiving a letter in the post for missing a deadline that she didn't even know she, she had to meet. And of course, this is her children's grief. A mother's primary concern will be for her children and how they are coping. It must be traumatic for a child to witness a death on the farm. Sometimes there is also further family breakdown as there is many opinions on what should happen with the farm. Parents-in-law not happy with the widow's decisions. Grandchildren facing further loss of their grandparents as families fall out. We have seen instances of injunctions being taken out against parents-in-law. Thankfully, it is rare, but it does happen. We also meet parents whose child has died a sudden death. And we also meet adults who mourn the sudden death of their father, the loss of their mentor, the person they've worked with each day. And these adults, Children, they try to take on their father's role within the family. Sometimes that may be welcome within the family, other times not. Even if it is welcome, it can bring an added pressure. Even if there is a will in place, it can sometimes bring division in the family, as some may not be happy with the contents. All an added stress and a pressure to a person's grief while they continue to farm. We also meet adults whose siblings have died by sudden death, where that sibling was the farmer in the family. Does the sibling left behind now face running a farm out of a sense of duty? Do their parents expect them to now be the farmer? Has the sibling expressed their feelings about giving up their own work to return to be the farmer? Is it what they want? If it is what they want, how is that received by others in the family? Family breakdown can be all too common over succession in farm families. As farmers believe themselves to be the custodians of the land, 
to pass it from one generation to the next and to not be that generation that can hand it on better than you got it, that, that takes its toll on a, on a farmer. All of these practical things that I've, I've spoken about here, they're all on top of a person's grief. A sudden death and what it brings is a lot for a grieving person and a family to try and cope with. I guess Embrace Farm, we're here to support um, all of you who unexpectedly find yourselves on this journey of loss and trauma. And to help the well-being of our farm families, Embrace Farm has built a community of support in response to your needs. Embrace Farm has created a space for people to connect and share your story with people who truly understand the devastating impact a farm tragedy has. We currently support about 400 farm families in our support network, and we do that by hosting an annual remembrance service on the last Sunday of June each year, by facilitating support groups for widows and families with young children. And we also have our Encircle programme, which provides tailored supports to the specific needs of each bereaved family through counselling and consultations with farm business advisors and legal and financial experts and planning and succession planning experts as well. Farmers are a resilient people and they want to do their very best for their land and their animals. I know in my home, as it is in many farmhouses, the animal and the human are treated just as important as each other. The pressures that face, farm, uh, face farmers today are mounting each day with changing regulations uh, and climate action, the un unpredictability of the weather, producing a product where price consistently changes up and down without a farmer's input, breakdown in herd health. To be hit with just one of these things is tough to cope with, but to be hit with a multitude of things one year after another really takes a special kind of person to not buckle under that pressure. I was glad to hear Liz earlier on just to say, you know, this isn't your fault. And I think it was lovely to hear that. I know in our farm, farm family here in our house, in our home here in Leash, over the past year, we have coped with sudden death, financial burdens because of my father-in-law's sudden death, inheritance issues, and we've been hit with TB as well. And then the constant change of milk prices up and down leaves us with a lot of uncertainty in how to plan going forward. Farming is a very difficult landscape to work in. But as a people, farmers do want to do their best. However, they need the help of others in the sector because farming has changed these past years. It has become very isolated with the introduction of machinery. A lot of farms are now financially unsustainable. The family farm structure where everyone did their bit has changed. And realistically, the farmer needs to be a jack of all trades with a constant list of never ending jobs to be done. And we're here tonight to let you know that Hug and Embrace Farm are here to support and advocate for farm families following a sudden death. We've been there ourselves. We know it's a difficult road to travel. And while my presentation has mostly been about the impacts to the farm family, I welcome Lisa's pre presentation, normalising our reactions to grief. And I look forward to what Fiona will have to say about the impact of suicide on our families. So just, just to say thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much, Norma. And just to invite everybody out there listening in to use the question and answers. Let us know what resonated with you. Do you share some of those experiences? Is there anything that surprised you, either from my presentation or from Norma's talk just now? So I'd now like to introduce you to Fiona. Fiona, you might turn on your camera there and unmute yourself. Fabulous. So Fiona Toomey is the CEO and founder of HUG. Fiona lost her 11-year-old daughter, Millie, to suicide in 2016. 
She was driven by her own need to meet other people bereaved by suicide. And she first set up, she set up the first HUG support group in Dublin in 2017. Since then, Fiona has advocated for support, education and research into the needs of those bereaved by suicide. She launched HUG as a charity on what would have been Millie's 15th birthday in 2019. So Fiona, I will pass over to you now. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, lovely to not see you, but to be with you and um, to everybody on the line. Um, I must say that I love to be part of these webinars because you learn something each and every time from everybody who speaks. And from Liz, it was so gorgeous to hear of the many different types of grief that we experience and the ways in which we experience them we experience them and more importantly the ways in which we can find coping with the different experiences of grief and hope is the one word that we hold front and center to everything uh, that we talk about and that we be and say and do you know as hog and everybody else on this call so um i'm going to share just a very um couple of slides with you and just talk very generally with you about HUG and what we offer um, and there may be just a little bit more information around what makes suicide bereavement different to other types of bereavement. Liz has told you a lot about you know, the different types of emotions that you have and they're common to all bereavements and as she rightly said grief after a suicide is absolutely grief with the volume turned up. Uh, that's something that we can attest to. Uh, but before I say anything else, let me tell you that there is hope. And I think that we are living proof that there is hope after suicide. There is hope that you will move forward. There is hope that you will integrate that lovely word that we heard from Liz will integrate your feelings around the horrendous loss. And there's no other word for it, but it's an absolutely horrendous loss. Uh, and there is hope of finding a new way of living, which is the way I like to think about it. It's not the same and you're not the same, but that doesn't mean that you're worse. It just means that you're different. So with no further ado, I'm going to see if I can successfully share my slides on screen. So here we go. Fiona, can I suggest, just because the internet connection is slightly rocky, you might just turn off your camera while you're sharing the slides. Lovely, thanks a million. I'll be able to hear you, just not see you. Okay, so hoping you can hear me, give me a thumbs up there. That's great. Okay, so um, as you heard from Liz, uh, HUG is a suicide bereavement charity and we're the only national suicide bereavement charity in Ireland. And you can see on screen there the many things that we do, but one thing we don't do is we don't provide counselling or therapeutic supports in the form of, you know, a, a formal therapy. That's not, not something that HUG provides. But what's at the centre to absolutely everything that we do is what we call the lived experience. And the lived experience is essentially that each and every person working within HUG and leading our support groups are people who have themselves been impacted by suicide. Now, that doesn't make us experts in grief. It makes us experts by experience in what we feel and what we say and do. And it also allows us to provide what we call um, evidence-based support. And that is central to everything that we do. So HUG started off in 2017. And um, as Liz said, it started when I myself was looking for a bereavement support group out, uh, to meet other people who had been impacted by suicide. And there weren't any around at the time. So HUG started off with one HUG group in Dublin in a place called Leopardstown, and then slowly started to build and expand the number of support groups that we provide. And the reason why we did that was that um, by talking to many people, we 
know that there isn't just often one way of addressing grief and bereavement. There are many, many different ways. And you can, I kind of think them as like little pots and you dip in and out of these pots, depending on how you are feeling at any given time. And for me personally, I wanted to meet other people who had experienced a similar loss or a death, a similar death as myself. And by meeting people with what we call a lived experience, that allowed me to share space with them. What's important around suicide bereavement to remember is, as Liz said, there's nobody to blame for somebody's death by suicide. And as often as we might say this out loud, it's often very difficult to feel it in our hearts and to actually own that statement. I know certainly for me, I struggled hugely with self-stigma, which is where we blame ourselves, you know, where you feel I could have saved the person if I had done something, if I had made a different decision, that person would still be alive. Now, it took me and has taken me a long time to understand that that simply is not true, that there are many, many reasons why somebody may die by suicide. Fortunately, there are not many children who, who die by suicide. It's more often than not, you know, adults. However, we do know that it is complicated. The reasons why somebody dies by suicide is rarely one thing. It can be a number of different things, and they may come together to form a catastrophic thinking. But regardless of how a person died or when a person died, what remains afterwards is the same the grief and the shock and the trauma and the absolute un unending questions of why. Now, the one thing I can promise you is that you will ever get to the end of the why. You may very well do. Or as Liz said earlier, you may get to the end of asking why or feeling the need to ask the why. And I think that's really important that for me and for many people, the space in between the why really elongates there are bigger gaps in between it and you often don't feel you have to keep asking the question but what's most important is having permission to ask that question and to ask it as often as you feel the need to do so and that's what hug provides is provides a space for that to happen you'll have often heard and i love liz's little image of like the neighbors chatting over the fence maybe gossiping you know, and that's what we call the stigma. And when we talk about stigma, there are two different camps. There's the stigma where you feel overnight that everybody is talking about you. And in fact, factually speaking, a lot of people are talking about you and they're not talking about you because it's a negative. They're talking about you because something shocking has happened to you and your family and your loved ones. And that's the end of what they may be talking about from that point of view. You have become public property to a certain extent overnight. Your grief may be very public. It may, in fact, be reported in the newspapers. Or perhaps it's a self-stigma where you just feel as if those conversations are taking place and they're not really taking place very often at all. But one thing we know from experience is that a lot of the time, the support is there, but people have absolutely no idea how to come and speak with you. The grief education in this country around suicide has been poor, and it's something that we try and change. So often people feel, I don't want to make the person feel worse, so I'm not going to say anything at all. Or I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to upset them more, so I'll say nothing. And as bereaved people, we know nothing could be further from the truth. A very simple, sorry for your troubles, can often suffice, or I don't know what to say. So within HUG, again, we provide that space where people can have those conversations. Our meetings take place every two weeks. And in those lovely, beautiful circles where you meet other people, you can have those conversations. And it's what we say, you can say the unsayable and it is kept private and confidential. 
So just to kind of go through the couple of little um, um, key points I have down here, when I say tailored information, I mean that HUG provides information around suicide specific supports around the country. And you can get them on our website and you'll get details of that later. You can speak to somebody on our phone and the person you're speaking to is somebody who works with HUG, who is also somebody who has been impacted by suicide. And they can be somebody who can just listen to you or indeed signpost you on to another service. You can come to one of our peer support groups, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. Or you can come to one of our public events. And these take place around the country um, in usually a, a hotel is where we meet and we invite, they're open to anybody in the community. And we do it for people who have been themselves impacted by suicide, or if you are somebody who's supporting somebody bereaved by suicide. Because we do know that, you know, we often forget it, it within our own shock and in our own grief that the people around us are often paralyzed themselves in, in not knowing what to say or not knowing how to go about supporting us. So where we don't find the words, you know, we can help provide them for the person. So that information can be if you're supporting somebody bereaved by suicide as well. So it can be really, really useful. We provide what we call advocacy. And we do this in our work with um, the HSE and other supports around the country. We've done some research nationally and we've got yeah, publications around uh, work that's been done on our support groups. And again, this is information which maybe as Liz so beautifully put it, as instrumental grievers you might find useful. The people who like to sort of do things by maybe understanding a little bit more about suicide and why it happens or what does what happens in a support group and what proof is there about how it happens. We can provide all that information for you as well, for you instrumental grievers out there. People like myself, I'm one of those, a bit blended, but probably a bit more instrumental. And then there's research, like I said. We, we love to take part in research because we know there's very little research on how people have been impacted by suicide and what supports they need and how to provide them. So that's really, really important. Uh, this is a beautiful quote that we received from one of our Hug Donegal group members. So I'm going to ask Arlene if she'll read it for me, please. Yeah, no problem. When my uncle died by suicide at the beginning of 2022, it impacted our family in two ways. Firstly, we had the grief of losing him to deal with. And secondly, we had to deal with losing a valuable work colleague on our busy farm. It was extremely stressful for us all as the work still had to be done but our mourning and sense of loss also had to be contended with. This put more pressure on our relationship as a family. But by joining the support group in Donegal and chatting with others who have lived what we were currently experiencing, I realized that there could be light in all that darkness. I had been to counselors before, but when I was surrounded by others who understood, it was e easier to talk about it. To me, Hug was invaluable for giving me hope that the future would be brighter. And for that, I will be forever grateful. Thanks, Arlene. Um, it's people like, you know, our hub member there in Dudley Goal. They give us the feedback to know that we're doing something right. And as we say, we can't fix grief. There is no fix in grief, but we can give it space. And where Alma and Embrace Farm provide not just practical supports on what is needed on the farm, you know, and very specifically around people who are bereaved within the farming community, we can provide that specific information around suicide, suicide um, support, suicide information and suicide support groups. Now, our groups are around the country and we're very pleased to have so many of you from around the country this evening. We would love to say we have one in every county. We don't yet. It's uh, our ambition to eventually have one in every county in Ireland. But the groups that you see here are what we call hybrid groups, which means that you can attend either in person or you can attend as an online participant. We use a little device called an OWL, which allows for an immersive group experience. So you don't feel like you are, say, on this Zoom call, that you are a bit disembodied or a bit separate from us. It is a very inclusive experience. 
and we have some virtual only groups, one specifically for parents, one for young adults, and then a general group. Um, all of our meetings take place in hotels, so they're comfortable and in a private space. And we do that because some people may have an association with a, um, uh, a facility or an institution or uh, a religion or something where they might not feel as comfortable. So this is a neutral space and also a very, very comfortable space. And again, the meetings are kept, you know, they're private and they're confidential, which I think is important for people to know about. What's also important to know about is if we go back to that word self-stigma where people may feel uncomfortable going to a local group, they can join a group as a virtual member somewhere else. So you could be living in West Cork, but decide actually I want to attend the Hug Monaghan group as a, as a virtual group member. That's okay too. So you can talk to us and we can help you decide what might be best for you. But the one thing I can promise you is regardless of what you are feeling now or any anxiety, after having had a conversation, you will find that what you are feeling around entering a group, every single one of us have felt before. And a lot of that falls away after you walk in the door and you see people who you know understand what it is that you are going through, at least the myriad of emotions that you're going through. So the next little video I'm gonna show you and then I'm going to stop talking, you'd be pleased to hear, is from um, one of our home group members. And, well, I'm just going to play it because uh, she'll say it a lot better than I could ever do. So I hope you can all hear this when I press my play. Hi, my name is Trish. And I lost my lovely brother Shay in 2018. He died by suicide. Losing my brother was the most traumatic experience I've ever had. And following his passing, I didn't know where to turn because until then I'd never been touched by suicide and no one I knew had been touched by suicide. Um, I tried one-on-one -on -one counseling, but it just wasn't for me. And then I discovered HUG, filled in the form and attended my first meeting. From that first meeting, I felt hope and it gave me the space to heal. Surrounded by those who'd been through it before, questions were answered. I didn't even have to ask the questions. They were answered by, by members telling their stories, their experience, what they were going through. So from that day, I felt I started to heal and you know, that it was okay. I, I knew I'd, ne I'd never feel normal again without my brother and the trauma of what had happened. But my life is normal now. A new normal, but normal. I think that, you know, that should really tell you a lot of things that perhaps you were asking, you know, in, in maybe thinking about your own head. We don't ask people, you know, um, to speak at, at hub meetings unless they wish to speak, you know, just to reassure you of that. And also there's no timeline on anybody coming to a home group. You, know, you can come for as long as you like. You can come as often as you like. And there's also no timeline on when the person who died by suicide. It's not that you have to wait six months or a year, nor do you have to, it doesn't have to be in the recent past. We have some people who've been bereaved many, many years who come to us and others who are more recently bereaved. And I suppose just in finally to say that, you know, we have um, many people who are from the farming community, you know, within our home groups, people who've lost sons, people who've lost uncles and brothers and dads. And while we don't, uh, as you know, sort of the centre of hope, we, we have not personally experienced a suicide on the farming community. What we can say is, is that, you know, it is a universal experience amongst all of us believe by suicide to feel hopeless and to feel, you know, often that, you know, nothing can ever improve. But I can promise you that 
in every day and in every way that there are always going to be some steps forward. Some may feel like steps sideways and backwards, but there will always be a little bit of progress. And you'll see that in a hug group if you choose to come. And if you don't choose to come to a hug group, I hope that you will get in touch with us and see if there's other ways that we can support you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Fiona. You might just turn your camera back on so we can just appreciate you to your face. Um, this, yeah, thank you so much, Fiona. That was so informative and gave such a message of hope. Um, and just to invite all our attendees, again, the Q&A is there. If you have any comments about Fiona's presentation or Norma's, if anything resonated with you, if you'd like to share it, now is your chance. We're coming towards the end of our evening now. Um, so as I said at the beginning, we'd love to take just a few moments to read out some of the reflections and comments that you've put in the chat. So if you'd like to uh, include anything now, it's not too late, stick it in there. We'd love to hear from you. How did you find this evening? Was it your first time coming to an event like this? Would you come again? What surprised you? What reassured you? All your comments, they're really welcome. We'd love, love to hear from you. So I'd love to invite um, Arlene and Alma to unmute there and maybe just read out some of the comments there in the Q&A for us. Sure, I wanted to start off um, one person here who I guess just reinforced your, your slide there earlier about the stigma and the shame that can go with, with uh, being bereaved by suicide. But she said that she once told a doctor that she was working with that her father had died by suicide. And he told me, she said, or this person said, I don't know their gender, I should have said my father had died of a heart attack or something else. Not helpful from a supposed care professional. And, you know, that's heartbreaking. I, you know, thank that person for sharing something so so vulnerable. And, you know, it, it, it does reinforce that there is same stigma. And although we are making progress talking about mental health and suicide, it can still happen that people will say those things. Um, another comment that came in was somebody thanking us for the presentation, saying thanks so much for a wonderful presentation. I say hello to my dad on starry nights as, as, as they were the nights my father would take me outside when I was young and show me the wonders of the stars. So a very nice continuing bonds. And another person about continuing bonds. I love spending time with my brother's children. Being near them reminds me of him. Someone here, Liz, said thanks very uh, much, Liz. It was very uh, helpful, your presentation. It gave them hope and it felt very relatable. And the last one that I wanted to maybe, and this is a question really to the panel, um, is that someone here says that they live in a very rural area where people all know about what has happened, but are reluctant to speak about it. And how do we get people to talk? It's an interesting question. Thanks, Arlene. And Alma, did you have any others there? There was um, quite a few. What has really been lovely um, is the fact that um, a lot of people feeling hope. And I think if there was one thing we really wanted to achieve tonight was, was to let people know that there is hope. Um, some people were saying, thank you for saying that there is hope. It means so much as it's so easy to feel that there is no hope. Um, thank you for a wonderful session. Um, we lost our, our brother a few months back and I'm being constantly challenged the kind of upbringing that we had and they themselves were very sick but they're on their recovery journey and um, another person um re recalled that their sister loved cats so after she died they she got a kitten a few months ago just to remind her of her of her sister and and something that i i would like to to reiterate that that somebody brought up they they commented on the fact that the stats are shocking for the farming community and incidents of suicide and and I really I mean it was it was great uh, when Norma was able to, to to say that you know things are getting better we are talking about it but we're at the very much the infancy of that uh, um approach and, and that is why events such as this 
this this evening is so important and that the power of talking and communication can never be understated. It's so, so um, important. And, and just a few comments coming in now, and it, it really is it's quite heartening. This was an excellent experience. I would certainly come again. Great webinar. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you all. Hug has been an amazing um, part of my life since my brother passed. Um, I'll be forever grateful. That's lovely to hear. And, and again, so, so, so sorry for your loss. And, and the fact that people, you know, have found this such a positive experience and, and would attend again. I mean, I think that's absolutely terrific because, you know, we keep the conversation going. We keep that their memories alive. And, and that's really what this is all about. That's great. Thank you so much, Alma. It's lovely to hear from people. So we're wrapping up now. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to Amanda from the Irish Hospice Foundation for hosting the webinar this evening. Um, to Fiona from HUG and Norma from Embrace Farm, along with Alma and Arlene for inviting me to speak today. It was a real privilege to be here with you. We're heading into the Christmas period now and I'm sure I don't need to tell you, for many of us following a bereavement, Christmas can be an endurance event rather than something nice to look forward to. So we wish you well. Um, in my experience, it's usually the anticipation and the lead up to the day that can cause quite a lot of pain and discomfort. Um, and people generally are happy when the day just arrives. So I would like to wish all of you uh, ease and peace and a good enough holiday period. Um, I hope people are sensitive and gentle with you as you grieve the loss of your loved one. So I'm going to just hold up the candle here now. Um, and yeah, thank you to everybody here. Remembering all your loved ones and our loved ones who have died and wishing you well for the future. Um, take hope away this evening, if you take anything. And we're going to be leaving a, a slide up on the screen with all of our contact details on it. I can offer support in the form of a podcast. Um, Embrace Farm and Hug have their different supports that they've gone through with you. And Amanda has the bereavement support line there behind her which will also be on the slide at the end of the webinar. So do take note of these things. You may not need them today, but they might come in very handy another day. So be gentle with yourselves. Remember the words, be excessively kind and gentle. And uh, thank you so much for your courage uh, to come along this evening and for sticking it out with us. Good night now, everybody. With care, my love, and speak the things you see. Let new names take and root and thrive and grow. And even as you travel far from heather, crag, and river, may you, like the little fisher, set the stream alight with glitter. May you enter now as otter without falter 
into water Look to the sky with care, my love And speak the things you see Let your names take a root And thrive and grow And even as you journey on Past dying stars exploding Like the gilded one in flight Leave your little gifts of light And in the dead of night, my darling Find the gleaming eye of starling Like the little aviator Sing your heart to all dark matter